Well, good evening, and we're starting a couple minutes early just as far as giving people who are going to join live the opportunity to, to join live. And um, we are getting close to being done, and I do want to thank you for joining. Um, we'll uh, continue to invite um, feedback as far as the way that you experience this material, especially um, you know what things you found most helpful. And... Um, and you can email those to me at rkinnaker at westsidenumeral1.org and I'll look forward to reading that. We're going to have one more um, discussion um, and I'm going to try to live into the, the thought of Kathy Sands of kind of moving this into you know a, a more concise statement of kind of in, in, a single, in a single talk how to kind of put all this stuff together. Um, I'm looking forward to the opportunity of doing that. Today I'm going to explain a little bit um, the really kind of, we've, we've been dealing a lot with theory and so how do we move from theory to um, interiorization? How, how do we begin to um, cult, try to actually cultivate humility? We have a bunch of ideas um, but the goal is, is to really have a transformed heart and, um, and to have this virtue, this characteristic of Christ, um, begin to be a characteristic of ours. So, um, what was I going to say? Um, well, one thing is, um, you know, if, um, if you've missed something you know there's the opportunity to go back the easy way to, to do this is to go to the website and look under videos and it'll have once you click on the tab for videos it'll have the cruciform way and then those are are all listed out as far as in dates and things like that um, it is 6 30 and so um, we're going to begin um, you know i you know, there's a little bit where, um, you know, coming into the night, you know, I'm looking and um, I haven't shaved yet. Um, and uh, my hair is a little bit blown because I, I was out and I was getting my exercise in and um, uh, continuing to try to get 10,000 steps in a day. And I did it. So that feels good. Started early today, going late today. Um, but, you know, this is... You know, this is the part where living our life, following Jesus, it's about passion. It's about um, finding a reason where you want to get up early and stay up late and, and realize that things are making a difference. And humility plays into this. This attitude of wanting to serve and put yourself in a position to help others. It's, it feels right. So... Uh, doctoral project, you, you have an idea, you're going to test it. Um, and my idea was is that um, a leadership cohort um, would be um, an effective means leaning in on the Christian tradition, um, the work of the Spirit, uh, biblical teaching um, to help cultivate um, Humility, and so that so you know, reaching way back as we began this talk, um, you know, I, I'm I'm testing this thesis, and and remember part of this is is the realization that um, f as far as um, there is no known clinical intervention, um, and and here I'm using kind of the language of psychology. As far as, as practically saying, how might we help people develop humility? But I believe that this is something Jesus wants to do. And, in the Christian, and through Jesus Christ and the Christian tradition and the work of the Holy Spirit, this is, this is something that we can step into. And, and my thoughts were a leadership cohort where we were going to grow together and, and really seek intentionally the pursuit of humility would be a means by which humility could be formed, and um, and so this was this was really 
a qualitative study versus a quantitative study. A qualitative study is one where you go, will it work? Quantitative study is how well does it work? When there's no known intervention, you're more going with will it work versus how well does it work? And so, um, so that was my beginning idea. And then it got into the part about, okay, breaking this down. And, um, and it started with um, theology and, and looking at um, an understanding of, of the context in which leadership happens, looking at um, the nature of leadership, and then turning and looking at the nature, the biblical idea of humility. Because this is really about when you're called to be a leader, can you cultivate humility and how might it be done? And, um, and so we covered all of that ground and, and you know, really was working towards establishing a, a New Testament theology of humility and leadership. And, um, and I think that a lot of what I have to offer in this is really the fruit of, of that study because surprisingly, the, the biblical New Testament idea of humility is not well understood. Uh, that's been my argument. And, um, and, and as you go through the literature and you look at it, it, it proves itself true. We, we tend to have a deficient understanding of what Paul was really getting at at the Topanos word group. Um, so we do the theology work, and then we do literature review. And... You know, in, 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 in actual practice, what happened was kind of the opposite. I mean, you, you end up reading, um, you know, my literature review ended up dealing with over 100 different books. And, um, and, I had, and I, that was part of w what I read, enabled both to complete my doctorate and to write the dissertation. And so there's that part of bringing those things in dialogue and, and kind of giving insight into to kind of what you get out of all of this literature, what, what stands out, um, what's it about. And, and part of the purpose of it is, is that you, know, you spend hundreds of hours reading these books and, and then writing this paper. Well, if somebody else is kind of walking the same road, you can look to see how, what they did before and you can get some idea. And, and so then there's that part where somebody else might come and read this at some point and go, oh, I haven't even come across this book yet, and this book looks like it would be a helpful one, or this was an insightful idea. Now, it, for us, there's, there's, this is, there's a lot of good content here, a lot of things to be thinking about, humility, leadership, uh, how might it be done. And so we, we covered that ground. That's kind of all the theoretical work, and then, and, then, and then you move towards an actual project, because the idea is not that I can regurgitate information from a book. The goal is the formation of Christ in me, and, and in this particular, the formation of the character of Christ with a focus on humility, and, um, and how might that be done? Now, you may forget this, but in, in, when we were dealing with the theology section, part of the theology section was, how does spiritual formation work? Um, and, and there's different approaches, there's different, um, there's different writers that end up providing frameworks that you, know, you, could, you could kind of live in. You know, I'll give like a simple example of, there's a whole bunch of ways to pray. Um, and, you know, and, and this is the part where, you know, even in scripture, I, I could give you a prayer that would kind of be a prayer that you could say every day, and it would kind of take the whole world of, of prayer and put it into a few simple words, and, and that's the Lord's Prayer. And, um, and sometimes what people do is they use the Lord's Prayer as a structure about how they enter into prayer. So you start by giving glory to God and then and, and, and just praising him for who he is and then you lift up his work of the kingdom. And then, and then there's the shift in the Lord's Prayer where then you begin supplicating and asking God to do things and, and, and asking for his provision in your life. And um, it's all good. But you could just say the Lord's Prayer. 
Or you could turn to the Psalter, and there's 150 prayers. And this will kind of take you into the big land of prayer. And you'll realize that you can pray your anger, and you can pray your, your grief, and you can lift up praise, and you can dance and sing, and, and you can complain, and all this stuff. So, you know, you've, you've, you've got these things. And another example would be acts. I could teach you to pray and I'd say, okay, just remember this, acts. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Define the words for you. And, and here is a rubric for you to go pray. Um, is one more right than the other? No. I mean, I, I, they're, they're all good. And, and they're helpful. And depending on where you are, you know, that may be something where it's like, you know, I really need to be led in prayer. Maybe I need to spend some time in the Psalms. Um, you know, maybe I, I, you know, just walking through and I, I'm just kind of beginning and this is a simple thing to memorize. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. So with spiritual formation, you could find different authors who talk about it and they'll, they'll you know, have their method of talking about, you know, how this all works out. If you're interested... You know, probably three big names when you think about spiritual formation. Um, Eugene Peterson, Dallas Willard, Richard Foster. All really good. Um, Eugene Peterson's probably had the biggest influence on me. Um, he's not a big systems guy, and it's not about building systems, but his is more expansive. And, um, and so in this, I, I went with Dallas Willard. And Dallas Willard... You utilize just a simple acronym, VIM. And, you know, and he, he sits there and he talks about it, VIM and vigor. Um, you know, and it, it means life. And knowing Jesus is about life. How does Jesus get formed in us? Well, it, it seems to be the way that all human progress is really made, where if we're not just trying on the spot, but we actually want to grow where we could do something by training and trying that we would never be able to do just on the spot, just by pure effort, then VIM becomes the standard way of transformation. You have a vision, you have to have an intention, and then there needs to be the means. So for example, you want to be able to play Beethoven. Well, you probably can't really play Beethoven if you've never learned how to play the piano. But you can one day play Beethoven, and, and it, it, but it's going to take time. And, and so you, you have this vision, I want to play Beethoven. And then you've got to make the choice, I'm going to do it. And the secret is, and part of the means is, I'm going to make this choice over and over and over. Okay, I'm going to go to somebody who knows how to play the piano. I'm going to sign up for lessons. I'm going to start learning my scales. I'm going to start doing the simple basics. I'm going to learn how to read music. And, and I still can't play Beethoven yet, but I'm on the road there. And as long as that I have simple means of, I, you know, I, my, my fingers work, my, my eyesight works, my mind is sharp enough still that I can remember um, and, and understand the theory, enough time. I may not be a concert pianist, but I'll be able to play Beethoven. And I'll be able to do something that I was never able to do before. So I find that a simple, helpful concept that I carry around with me. And I use Vim, vision, intention, means. Now, when it comes to the formation of Christ likeness, I, I, and I, I absolutely appreciate Willard for this. The primary means of transformation in the Christ likeness is the Holy Spirit. This is spiritual work, and it's what the Spirit does in us. It's what He wants to do in us. But it, it's much easier when we participate. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll say this: it's one of the. I think it's an important dictum. Grace is opposed to an attitude of earning not effort. Um, when we think we have to earn God's favor, we're missing the mark of, of all of this. Um, it leads to a legalism. It leads to judgmentalism. It leads to guilt. 
but effort is not opposed to grace at all. I, I want to work with all the power that God gives me towards the goal that he's called me. That's biblical. That's, 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 the, that's actually gives assurance. That's, that's really what God wants to form in us, our hearts beating with passion. Um, so, it's primarily about the Spirit's work, but you and I have a part to play. And, and this moves us into the idea of spiritual discipline. So, I'm, I'm using this framework, and I say, okay, this is going to be really about spiritual transformation. But how might it be done uh, uh, with, with people, towards humility? And, and one of my convictions, and it, was getting, it, it, it came early on, is um, the idea of sitting there saying, this is, this really, if this is going to be effective, it needs to take place in community. It's a social virtue, um, and and you know, and so this is the part where it's like, okay, and this is why in my thesis, a leadership cohort, a small group of people, all with some experience of being called into a place of leadership, and 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 here I want us to intentionally define leadership broadly. One of the people in the group, primary place of leadership was in the home as a mother, that's a call of leadership. Another person in the group, you know, you know, they, they had a position, administrative position, um, in, you know, in a in a large um, in a large situation, um, you know, somebody else, um, you know, a single, you know, solo business owner, but they're leading their business and 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 you know, and they're making their way. Um, Another person was in a position of leadership, middle, you know, kind of a, a middle manager, but, you know, had a group of people that worked under them. And, um, you know, and so this was the part where, you know, there was a part about saying, okay, want to want to invite people and um, into this experience where we're going to look to seriously grow up together in Christ. And, um, and that becomes part of this vision. So, I'm kind of sharing with you just kind of like how I started to think about this. And, and then ultimately then, you know, you, you kind of have a, a rough idea and then you start to develop your plan. And the way that I developed the plan was really utilizing the, the sense of vision. Now, one of the things that happened here is, okay, I, I want it to be a small group because I think transformation works best in small groups. I didn't want it just to be a class because the problem with just a class is that oftentimes we reduce it down into just the gathering of information. But this is, this is going to be more than gathering information. This is about interiorization. And, and part of this is, is that what happens when you get into a small group, and it's a group that's committed to growing together, where you're intentionally saying, okay, I want, I'm going to pray for you. I want you to pray for me. We're going to, we're going to be looking. We're going to be wanting Christ formed in us. We're, and, and we're going to be sharing. And it's going to move towards accountability. That, the, the, that takes place best in a smaller group. You know, Jesus chose 12. Um, I invited nine. Maybe ten. Ten, I think. And... Um, Everybody, but one per everybody said yes in the beginning, and then one couple ended up moving, and so they weren't able to be part of it. And then one person was just too busy as far as with work, and so we became a group of seven, which is a nice biblical number. If you've ever taken a class with Revelation for me, yeah, well, so we had seven of us, which is a good number of perfection. So okay, now. The whole plan gets planned first. You, you kind of, and, and then you execute it. Now, I'll share a little something which was, you know, so I started with this whole thing of saying, well, you know, th this, this is not to get a degree. This is to, to really try to, to move into, you know, having character of Christ, humility, something get formed in us, a, a way forward of helping people see not only the value, but how it might be done. 
And um, so I, I sat down and I prayed and then I started thinking through, okay, well, how, you know, so what does this need to be? And, and I very much intentionally looked at this vision, intention, means, and I'm going, I'm hard baking this into the process. This, I'm very intentionally going to be thinking about vision and how do we hold up this vision. And we got to keep looking at this goal of humility. And on one level, this is going to be content, this is going to be teaching, this is going to be curriculum, and, and that's going to be part of the vision. But the, but the vision has to be cast at the beginning. And, and if this is going to work, if it's going to be what, we, what, what I believe it needs to be for it to actually be effectual, make change, then it, it, it's, it's going to be something that at the outset, I'm calling people to a high bar. Um, it, it, we're going to look to grow together. If you've never experienced a serious discipleship opportunity, this is going to be serious. Now, that, that became part of it. And the other part of it um, was, was then thinking through, based on a lot of, I mean, I'd already done a lot of study up to this point, a couple of years of reading and writing and research and things like that, and, um, you know, and so then I'm, I, and I just started this way. I said, okay, so seriously, if, if we're going to, in some way, grow up together, it, six weeks won't cut this. I mean, yeah. remember, humility is a life's work. So, you know, six quick weeks, woohoo, yeah, that's not going to work. That's, you know, and so, so then it was kind of like, okay, so, hmm, how to do this. Now, one of the things that had happened is that I, um, in leading up before I got here, but while I was doing my doctorate, and, but, but really this had to do with work of the church. We're, we're working on our strategy of discipleship. How do we help people go from being an unbeliever to somebody who, who is maturing in Christ and realizes that God's calling them to come back and help other people who could even be an unbeliever move forward in their relationship with Christ? And, um, you know, and as a church, we should have a discipleship strategy, and there should be a place all along the way for all of us that challenges us to grow up. Um, and and at, at this end of, okay, how do we help more mature people understand really what, how do, what does growth look like, and, and what is God calling us to do? I taught about 36 people a Wednesday night class um, utilizing a resource called... Um, uh, real life discipleship, and it was a training manual. And um, and and you know, if you, any of you are watching this, thank you for being part of it. It really was helpful, and on a number of levels, we're still leaning into that. I I think it's a a great tool. We actually used it with the trainees. We plan on continuing to use it to help train people in the church about just understanding what leadership is in the church and this role of growing up. And um, but most of the people who were in the class had been Christians for years, decades, and none of them, except for two, had ever experienced any formal discipleship before. And this class was a little bit more towards the formal discipleship. And, 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 I, and I wasn't altogether surprised by it, but then that's where I thought about it. I said, you know, we're, this is really about discipleship. This, we need to be on the same page about what, what Christ wants to do in us. we got to start there. I mean... I kind of intentionally went with people who, you know, who were, you know, more in their 30s and 40s and, and maybe hadn't had any discipleship yet. And, um, and so I went, okay, well, there's that. Well, that's 12 weeks. But that's just the beginning. And part of what you learn in that is, is you learn how to lead a group so that you can do it to others. And I thought, well, you know, the, part of this is getting people to go from I'm learning to I'm practicing. I'm, I'm, I'm actually a practitioner. This isn't just an idea, but, but I'm doing. You know, this is kind of why in the Alpha course, they, they, they try to encourage people to get involved in the next Alpha course because we learn more when we do. And so, so there's this part where it's like, okay, We've, we've just gone through this, and it's going to equip you to facilitate a Bible study. 
And I thought, okay, well, let's give people the opportunity. And, and part of this is coming to understand the biblical idea of leadership. You know, what I want people to kind of go, okay, what does it mean to be called to be a leader and pursue humility? And so every person was given an assignment that for one week they were going to prepare a lesson where they chose a passage that dealt with leadership and they were going to lead the group time. Um, now, a couple things are going on in my plan. Vision. We're getting content. We're learning. We're growing. We're having a sense of clarity. This is what leadership looks like. This is what humility looks like. Right now, we're just getting the idea this is what spiritual growth looks like. This is what leadership looks like. But in the midst of that, there's also then intention. You choose. You choose whether or not you go that week and you do the homework and you work through this booklet. And see, and I chose something that it really required work. And, and you know, and, and, you know, you as the leader have to be willing to do it. But if, but if you're setting that vision and, and, and then, you know, and, and you're saying, okay, this is what we're going to do and this is going to be, I think it's going to be significant. And, you know, this is the part where we're really going to look to grow together. But, but it's going to be up to you to really choose it. Now, my group was wonderful. They were, in, they were, they were into it. Um, they were willing to do that. And, and then what happens is, is okay, you, you did this. Now you're starting to now take it even another level because you're going to lead at times. And um, it's going to put you on the spot. But, it, you know, and, but it kind of, are, are you in? Will you do it? Yes, you do it. And then after looking at spiritual growth, understanding discipleship, leadership, now we're going to deal with humility. And 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 obviously I'm going to I you know I did, I'm going to teach this. I've spent a whole bunch of time, and and you know and 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 here we're I want to make sure they that they get the content and understanding. And so so but the kind of the same sort of format we modeled it. Um, it might have been I, I kind of think maybe even a little bit of a mistake I made is is that. You know, I allowed the modeling that came from the real life discipleship, and I probably would have probably been more helpful if I had created a little more written curriculum for them instead of just kind of following the model of how they led the group with the leadership issues. But you know, you learn and, and go. I, I'll probably change that next time, as far as trying to quantitatively make the experience better. Um, now, I'll, I'll shorten this part up. So I'm sitting there and I'm thinking through all of this. I'm writing my curriculum. I didn't start with, and I want to do it in 12 weeks or 6 weeks or 8 weeks or 14 weeks or 20 weeks. I just sat there and I said, what do we really need to cover? And what is going to be an effective plan that will have the hope of helping people really grow? And it ended up that what I came up with was 45 weeks long without any breaks and um, now so here's a little bit of a funny part with this so um, at this you know so so I, I'm working out my plan and thinking through it and and you know and there's more to the plan I'll tell you a little bit about it but in the doctoral process you, you've you've written this up in some sort of a proposal form and you know, and it gets turned in. And but one of the things that ends up happening is, is that this is your final project proposal. And so there were 22 of us that were in my leadership cohort with the doctorate group. And so when we were done with our third residency, the last thing we did was everybody shared what they thought that their project was going to be. And um, it just so happened that I was like about the. Uh, I must have been about the third to the last person to go. You know, so we were in a circle and everybody's going around and they're all sharing their things. And um, uh, I was a little bit, you know, I mean, I listened, but I was a little bit surprised because almost every, the, the longest project besides mine was six weeks long. I mean, people chose four week projects and six week projects and, you know, and I'm listening to these things, and it's kind of, you know, I mean, they, it's what they were interested in and, and stuff. And, um, 
you know, and so then I, I, I get to mine and I share, you know, what I'm going to do. And, and, and they were, and, and people were just like 45 weeks. Who's going to sign up for 45 weeks? This is, you know, and, and Jim's kind of like, well, you know, I mean, the thing is, is you, you, you come up with a project, but you don't know how it's going to go. And you report on it, whatever happens. You know, it could be that everybody, you know, it, it, it's just, it fails because it was too hard or rigorous or whatever. And then that's what you end up reporting. Now, the, the, the funny thing for me was, is that I had already, I had my project done before I went to my last residency. And I had actually already met with the group, invited them, had it all spelled out, and everybody was committed. I mean, I, you know, so so when they were sitting there going, how are you ever going to get anybody to do this? It's like, we start in September. I'm really excited. I'm the, we're, they're raring to go. We, we, and so, and everybody sucked through. It was, it was great. Um, but, I, you know, I, uh, what I would say about it is this, you know, and one of the secrets of all of this is we need community. I mean, I'm sure you're feeling it with COVID. I mean, we're made for this. Now, it's really good to be in a community and it has a strong sense of vision and, and, and you have a sense of hope and a desire. I mean, that's the part where, you know, I, I mean, a 45-week commitment isn't for everybody. But... If you get invited to be part of a group of people where you're going to share life together, you're going to care for one another, you're going to pray for one another, that's what life groups are. And it's really good. And God works through that. He works in community. So, the vision, here we go. Now, to, to kind of finish out a little bit, so we're going to learn about leadership, we're going to learn about humility. And then the next big thing was having the opportunity to introduce to people the idea of spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines are, are can be a very good thing, but oftentimes people end up getting taught spiritual disciplines or model spiritual disciplines in such a way that you really miss what the Holy Spirit is trying to do, wants to do, and it becomes legalistic. It becomes oppressive. And so, part of the curriculum was we read Dallas Willard's book, The Spirit of the Disciplines. And, um, and it culminated with the idea of, of I, I then introduced him to, um, John Ortberg has a chapter in a book, The Life You've Always Wanted, and it's developing your own rule. And, and this, is, you know, this is very much modeled on, on looking at the wisdom of monasticism, a very intentional, communal experience in Christ, very covenantal, where you're, where you're banding together to grow up together and, and you're going to create certain rhythms that will enable God's Spirit to be at work to form Christ in you. And, you, and you're going to encourage and pray and work and, and call one another your, to your best selves. And so, and, and within that, that was a part of, okay, so look at, you know, look at these sorts of things that Christians have done over the years that create pathways for Christ to work in our hearts and changes. Scripture reading, prayer, worship. And, um, and so, you know, we, we, we looked at the idea of spiritual discipline, the idea of training versus trying on the spot, understanding it's really a work of grace. And then... It's time for you to make another decision. Intention. And part of the wisdom, I think, of, of this, and I very much was intentional on this, is that along the way, I very much progressively tried to raise the bar a little bit higher of calling you to make a decision and commitment. I mean, I gave people the option after the 12 weeks of, of doing the real-life discipleship, if you don't want to continue, you can back out. But, you know, this is the level that we're, we're, we're digging at. We did this from 8 to 10 o'clock at night on Tuesday nights. Um, people had to get up early for work the next day. There were kids that, you know, were in bed, but, but they stuck through it. And, um, and then 
and then they wrote their rule. And, and the rule was kind of like, okay, w where are you at and what would be some rhythms that you could try on that would allow you to practice and train so that the Holy Spirit could have his way and help form things. Now, here's one of the things that happened that I, I wasn't expecting. I designed the project. This is very much going to plan. And then we got here, and then, and then I experienced something. And what I experienced in the midst of it was, you know, we're, we're all in different places in our relationship to Christ. And I'm feeling called to cultivate humility. But maybe that really isn't the call that Christ has on you. I mean, one of my things is, is that I do not lack confidence. It's one of my strengths. I have this thing called assurance. And I just don't, I'm, I'm re I really don't worry much. And, and ambition is something, I'm an achiever, I want to do things. And so, you know, I, so humility for me is very much something I, I am... I am consciously pursuing knowing my weaknesses. But not everybody's like me. And so as we're getting into this, and we're, and we're in this group, you know, and, and it's really about what does Christ want to do in your life right now? You know, it got to the place where I just told people, I said, you know, when you think about coming up with kind of a rule as far as a rule is a major standard, some rhythms, some spiritual practices, don't worry about humility. Just do what you feel like God's calling you to focusing on. Could be intimacy. It could be, um, you know, having um, compassion be something. You know, so so that's that becomes the part where instead of just okay, everybody's got to do what I want you to do. It became the thing of, and and in this, it's it's it, it was being pushed by the sense of humility. At the end of the day, you know, I, I may not get the same information that I was hoping for from everybody in the group about, you know, how this helped form humility. But in the midst of it, it's like, well, maybe maybe humility isn't at the top of the list for everybody. And um, so that was the decision that I made. And nobody else actually chose to pursue cultivating humility. They chose to pursue kind of what was really, you know, their issue where they felt like God was saying, here's where I want you to be conformed and formed into the likeness of Christ. And, 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 then, and then it became the part where I was like, okay, you're, you're gonna, you need time to try on the practices that you're doing. You know, some people, one person said, you know, I want to practice solitude. And I'm, and I, and I'm going to regularly cultivate and pursue getting away a little bit each week and, and having this space where I can just be with God by myself and, and have that. You know, and they read a book on solitude and, and they pursued it. And we encouraged them. And they came back and they shared. And so that, that takes time. So now we're going to start sharing about how our spiritual habits are. But, but we're going to continue to grow together as, as that's kind of this now new thing. And there's a choice to make. You could just ignore it. But if you, if you lean into it, if you make that choice as well, uh, well, I think, it, I think it's opening up more of your life. It's another place where you say, Jesus is Lord and I'm following him. And I'm going to become more intentional. And I'm going to become more committed. I'm showing my commitment. I'm showing that decision. I, I'm choosing it today. And so then we continued then with some more study and we started looking at the issue of leadership again. And we, we read a book uh, by Bill Robinson, which I've talked about, which is um, uh, The Incarnate Leader. And then we analyzed that book. Um, and then, you know, and, and then that's kind of where that, that kind of finished the culmination of that 45 week thing. And people then gave a report about just kind of what the experience was and, and stuff. And, and then that group decided that they wanted to stick together. And, um, but that was a picture of the process. Vision. Intention. Intention isn't something you do just once. you you got to choose. I mean, really, for habits to be formed, it's something you choose 
every day. You get up. You give glory to God. You, you pursue Him. You put Jesus first. Um, you know, and oftentimes the way that people do it is, is that they commit a certain time to pray. They read God's Word. Um, they learn God's ways. They, they practice simple obedience. So, vision, intention means the first thing was the very first thing that we did and i haven't told you about this yet is i invited everybody over for dinner and um, we barbecued and uh, people were able to bring kids if they wanted to um, and um, you know, and, and I had the house set up for a party. Um, I had music playing. We ate good food. We talked. We, we laughed. We shared. And towards the end of it, I shared a little bit about my vision about what this group could be and how we could help each other grow. And at the heart of it, and this is, again, the means, the curriculum has a place. But the means is primarily going to be through community. It's going to be through the sharing of our life. It's going to be becoming friends. It's going to be opening up and getting to the place where you and I, you know, we, we, we actually are getting real with one another. Because in order to make progress in this, in, in some way, there, there needs to become a level of transparency. So... So that was the first thing, just setting the mood, the temperature, um, having it be in a house, around a table. I don't invent this stuff, right? This is learning from Jesus. This is what he did. Um, and it's about saying, you know, it, this isn't about us spending an hour a week together. This is about us sharing our lives together. And being committed to one another means a regular meeting time, doing your homework, um, coming prepared. There's a difference of quality when everybody takes time and they come into a discussion and they've thought about it and they've prepared and they've studied. Um, I, you know, I've I've been leading lots of groups for you know decades now. And, you know, and, and I'll work with everybody. But when, when you can get a group to finally really get on board with coming prepared, looking to grow, um, it goes a long ways. Means. Regular meeting time. Praying for one another. Sharing life together. So there's the curriculum that we do, but, but then there's the life that we share. Um, and, and as a leader, not being just concerned about your agenda, but listening for the Spirit. So, one of the things that I learned, one of the things that happened that, that I think made this group happen the way that it did, is, you know, we're, 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 we're just getting started, and we're working through this real-life discipleship training manual. And I was like, you know, we we if we're if if we're gonna get in it, we we need to know each other a little bit more. And so I proposed an idea. I think it was the first week. This was all intuitive at this point. This is some of the stuff where, you know, you, you get into it and you it I I think that this project is repeatable, but if you've never been a life group leader before then then you probably would need some training in order to pull this off. Um, but I'm sitting there and I'm kind of feeling things out. And then I, I said, you know, I, I have an idea. What if what if at the beginning of, of our, our next meeting together, one of us shares a little bit of our life story with the group um, so we can get to know each other better? You know, we've committed to growing together and, and part of, really growing together is knowing each other. And um, now if you're, if you're a leader, 
part of leading is, is that you, you help set the temperature of the room. The speed of the leaders, the speed of the group. And I, it was my bright idea, so I volunteered to go first. And, um, and, and I shared wounds and hurts and pain and, and, uh, and, and about my life. And then the next person shared, and they shared about wounds and pains. And, and, and we went around over seven weeks, and every person in the group ended up sharing. And what we realized is, is that we all of us are carrying wounds and hurts that you know most people wouldn't even be aware of just looking at us on the surface. And they profoundly shaped us. And, 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 and it was one of these things in doing that that it, it got us deeper, quicker than I've experienced any other group I've been in. And, um, and, and that's grace. That's the gift of the Spirit. Christian communities being formed. Um, means the Holy Spirit. Um, this is His work. Uh, it, it means listening to. It, it means having a plan, but letting God interrupt it. It means thinking that everybody's going to pursue humility and then realizing that when you get there, are you forcing people to all choose humility as the thing that they go after wouldn't be humble. Um, scripture, uh, Christian tradition. So, so those became the means, hard-baked into to, to what we were doing. And, um, and that became the project. And uh, now, uh, uh, something else that happened. Um, a group that plays together stays together. A church that plays together stays together. I'm pretty sure fellowships in the work of coming up with a trivia night sometime in the near future. Um, you know, we, we were committed that was a year where we got the five feet of snow, um, uh, you know, and we started being a, a real life group together. One of the uh, families um, got snowed in. Uh, others of us came with shovels, and we got them snowed out. Um, we got to a place where we were kind of like, okay, we've been doing lots of study. What if we just, like, have a game night together? And, and that became part of the rhythm. And so it ended up that 45 weeks really became, oh, what was it? Mm, something like 65 weeks or something like that. And uh, so that was the project. And let me share with you um, some of, I'll share with you my conclusions. I'm going to start with this, and um, okay. Uh, I did one of the things at the end is is everybody filled out a survey. It had quantitative and qualitative questions. Um, this was a qualitative study, but. You know, I still wanted to give some input about their experience of things. Um, it, it, it impacted everybody's life significantly. And, um, you know, there's, um, and, and I'll, so I'll, I'll, I'll say a couple things. So, The survey ended with four open-ended questions to allow people to share whatever they felt needed to be shared. From their response, it is as clear that the biggest perceived value of this cohort experience was the experience of Christian community. Dietrich Bonhoeffer's insight, the physical presence of other Christians as a source of incomparable joy and strength, 
in the believer was proof was proof true in our fellowship. When asked if they if you had it to do over again, would you have made this commitment to be part of this experience? Why or why not? The unanimous and overwhelmingly enthusiastic response was yes, 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 absolutely 100% and definitely. It was not simply the value of friendships in the group, but also the perceived growth in their relationship with Jesus Christ that made this cohort experience significant. That's what they said. Um, now, I, I did a survey, and then this is a qualitative study, and so then there was, I, I gave reports about the survey. I, I won't read that because I don't want to tip the hand about that, but um, I, I will share observed impact. This is my observations about what happened. As soon as we started sharing our life stories with authenticity and vulnerability, which was weeks two through nine, including wounds and difficulties we had all faced, I was excited about the possibilities of how God could use this group to help catalyze growth in each of our lives. Um, one person was battling a health issue, um, and that is something that could have really broken the group. You know, the person has to step back, and now the group shrinks. And um, But the person didn't, and that entire experience helped the group throw, draw closer together. Humility, of course, helps with this. Humility helps train us to serve. Of course we'll serve, flex, accommodate, and help. That person going through that meant that we all ended up in practice making some adjustments because we wanted this person to be part of the entire experience and to, and to help them go through what they were going through. Gathering to help the family as they struggled with all of the different things, shoveling snow, um, you know, and it, it becomes the actual experience. It's a privilege. Of course I want to do that. It's, it's joy. Uh, some small thing to help somebody going through something really difficult. There was also fun and there was fellowship. Um, we saw growth not just in study and discipline, but people expressed emotional and spiritual healing, increased passion for Jesus, clarity of purpose, and a greater faith in God's faithfulness. While all the other participants did not form habits to pursue humility, they did form a solid biblical understanding of humility. The focus on growing as leaders was also important and impactful. Um, as the only participant who intentionally directed the formulation of a personal rule towards cultivating humility, I can affirm that this leadership cohort project can be a valid path for pursuing humility. Again, I believe that if we really ask for and pursue humility, this is a prayer that God wants to answer in our lives. At the same time, I'm more convinced than ever that this sort of intentional, disciple-oriented, small group experience which holds up a biblically faithful vision, calls for decision, keeps in step with the Spirit, is informed by Scripture and tradition, it will work to form Christ in His people. It'll help to form love and joy, peace, and even humility, but also kindness and gentleness, self-control, grace, and faith. The fruit of the Spirit will be manifest. Report on my anticipated outcomes. It was my expectation this would be a transformative experience with participants affirming the positive value of this experience, helping them grow as disciples of Jesus. This was enthusiastically the case. I also anticipated that Trying to create accountable, accountable community would be an important catalyst for perceived growth. I think my, my findings help to support this anticipation with qualification. We fail to become as accountable to the degree originally envisioned, especially with regard to the formation of habits. At the same time, there was an overall culture of accountability. Everyone took seriously participation, sharing, preparation, and trying to live into what we were learning. I expected that the biblical teaching on humility would transform participants' understanding of the virtue and how to pursue it. I would say that this project demonstrates this to be mostly true. The participants' working definitions support that they now have a deeper and richer understanding of the biblical idea. Their expressed answers also indicate they have a clear idea how to cultivate humility. 
But because participants do not practice habits with the express desire to cultivate humility, there is less qualitative data to answer the question more definitively. I also anticipated that this experience would help us grow as leaders. I think this was proved as well. But again, the evidence was a qualitative assessment helping to answer that this leadership cohort model is a fruitful path for cultivating leadership. Finally, as anticipated, the practice of spiritual disciplines proved difficult, but the practice helped people reach a new level of commitment in following Jesus. It is not easy to be formed into the likeness of Christ. Um, and, you know, and you and I are going to struggle, and there is a part in us that resists it. Um, and, and so this work of character transformation is tough, but it's also good. And, and it's a goodness that you can feel and know. And so the most important things in life usually aren't easy. And, um, and being formed in the character of Christ isn't but it's the most important thing that actually happens for us. Something that I did not anticipate was just how profound the experience of Christian community is for making this experience work. Yes, content is important, but it is when the Word is made flesh, when the Spirit breathes His Word into our hearts, when we experience the unity of being the family of God, that ultimately we move from studying merely written words to becoming living epistles. Um, it's an illusion if you're not aware from 2 Corinthians 3.3. 3. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone but on tablets of human hearts. Um, I gave ideas about what further research might be done and then this is my conclusion. From the outset of this project, I had a strong conviction that a discipleship-oriented cohort experience would be con constructed to help cultivate, could be constructed to help cultivate humility. It's possible. With the standard modern definition of humility, a low view of one's important, my conviction has the appearance of either undermining the very pursuit of humility or indicating why I so desperately need it. You know, I mean, if, if you're functioning off of don't think too highly of yourself, and then you think that you can actually form a, a way in which you can become more humble, well, you, you might be thinking too highly of yourself. My confidence in finding a path to cultivate humility, however, was never in myself, which in one sense seems to support the common definition of humility. My confidence has always been in my conviction that the Spirit of Jesus Christ wants to form in us His humility and his mindset. As I started down this path, I quickly came to realize that my working definition of humility was deficient. How can Paul claim humility and still be humble? How can Prouse and Topanos be synonymous when the first was seen as a virtue and the latter was seen as an anti-virtue? Why have I not heard more about the importance of understanding the Greco-Roman honor-shame culture when interpreting the New Testament? And as I began to form my working definition of humility, I realized that the biblical mindset of humility is not focused on how we think about ourselves, but how it motivates us to take loving actions. As I coupled this biblical understanding with the wisdom of monasticism, the insight of spiritual formation, the leadership literature, I saw a clear path for us to walk towards biblical humility. At the same time, I think I have become more humble, or maybe the better word is tempered, in my expectations. There may be other paths that could be even better for cultivating humility, who knows. The progress is going to be slow. This is a life's work. Even if a leader does not intentionally try to cultivate humility, there's a good possibility humility will be formed because leadership is humiliating. Again, humiliation is not the same as biblical humility but it can lead to authentic humility. At the same time, I'm also convinced that cultivating biblical humility will have a greater likelihood if we are intentional in pursuing it. Now, I qualify it as biblical humility. One of my strongest convictions coming out of this project is the need for the church to hear the call to humility as a way of acting in love 
that overturned the honor-shame culture of the ancient world and trained God's people to a new way of being. I believe that if we raise up this kind of humble leader, the church will inevitably move back into its proper position. The position is captured by a master, a great one, who knew that all authority and power had been given to him. So what did Jesus do with his power and privilege? He stood up from the table and raised himself to his full height. He then took off his outer clothes. In appearance, Jesus identified as a slave. What is more, he wrapped a towel around his waist and took the lowest position in the household, and then he washed the feet of his followers. Nothing like this had ever been done in all of human history. These words are to all who would follow him. Do you understand what I have done for you? You know, I really did not understand. That's my answer. There was too much time in history for me to comprehend what Jesus was really doing there. And then again, even Peter and the others did not understand, at least not right away. You call me Rabbi and Lord, and that is correct, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord, remember that Rabbi means great one, your Lord and great one have washed your feet. You also should wash one another's feet. I want you to follow my leadership. I want you to exist in my ways. I have set you an example that you should do just as I have done for you. And Jesus literally said, Amen and Amen. This is really important, so listen to what I am saying. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now if you know these things, you will be blessed if you actually do them. That's how I ended it. So, 7.30, kind of hit the mark just where I was hoping to. Um, we'll be back one more week next week. And um, thank you. And God bless. Good night.